Hey y'all, welcome back to the Late Night Vision Show. This is episode 31, and this is the one and the only, the original, the first podcast related to all things night vision and thermal imaging. Anybody else who comes along with a podcast is just a, <laughs> a, a, a copy of us. No, I'm just kidding. I've got my uh, my good buddy and the one, the original, the, the only Hans from the Hans <laughs> East Texas YouTube channel. What's going on? I, nobody would want to be me. I can tell you. That, <laughs> <laughs> that was a heck of an intro for that you was and the an show. Heck of an intro. Gosh, I man. might have exaggerated somewhere, but I don't know. Maybe. I'm going to tell you <laughs> from now on. You have the the duties of in, introing the show if it's going to be that good every time. Oh, it's gonna it's gonna get better. Uh, it's gonna be. I'm going to be the, the uh, since we brought him up the other day on the live show, I'm going to be the Ed McMahon. You're the Johnny Carson. <laughs> I'm the Ed McMahon. Oh, gosh. I'm, I'm here to make you look good. Oh, well, I tell you, I, when I do the intro, I feel like I trip up with to do two or three different takes because I, I seem to always forget what episode we're on. So you just well, rolled right through that. I, I Yeah, I was hoping it was really 31. I was just going to roll with it and, I wrote and it, go along. I wrote it on the top of the page for you. I knew. I, I knew you knew. Yeah, exactly. Help. That's why we have show notes, so yeah. you can tell me what we're going to do. Well, look, folks, uh, it, it is episode 31. Can't believe we've uh, you know had this many in the can. It's been fun. If you want to keep up with every episode of the Late Night Vision Show, the best place to find us right now is to watch the videos if you have time and if you're you know around your computer, and that's on YouTube. You can go to Absolutely. YouTube, click the subscribe. Uh, there's a little bell icon you can click. That way you'll be notified every time we've got a new episode that comes out. They do drop every Thursday. And uh, if you know if you don't have time to watch it on YouTube, then just definitely check it out on any of the major podcast uh, apps, uh, any of the the hosting services. You can check it out anywhere from uh, Google to Apple to anything in between. If you've got an app that's got podcast on it, most likely the Late Night Vision Show is there. So uh, subscribe if you can and never miss an episode. You can also find us on Instagram and Facebook, and you can like, share, subscribe, follow, whatever you're supposed to do there. Uh, you can do the same thing for Hans. I know you can find him on Instagram. That's the main place that he hangs out besides YouTube, <laughs> and uh, he's he's always over there posting uh, crazy pictures of, of hogs with with uh you know tire jacks, and you got to go check that out. That's, you know, just you got to go to Instagram and, and follow Hans there, but you can find him uh, also on YouTube is the main place. He's dropping videos once a week there, so be sure to subscribe. While you're there, look, you've already found the Late Night Vision show, show and subscribe. You found Hans. Go ahead and just subscribe to you know Outdoor Legacy Gear while you're there too. And you can find me on Facebook and Instagram. I have to admit that my Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube are lacking right now, and that is because uh, it's that time of year. Everything is blowing up. I can't answer the phone fast enough. I've got Hans helping me answer the phone and call customers back when he's free. So if you've got questions about thermal or night vision, if you're ready to purchase or you just need pre-purchase advice, uh, you give me a call. 877-350-1818. Uh, and you can find me at OutdoorLegacyGear.com. And you never know, you might call that number and old Hans might uh, answer or, or call you back. It has happened. I, I have called a few few people back and uh, had some great conversations with some people. I, I tell you, it seemed like everybody that I called uh, that called about questions about a scope uh, seemed like all of them were podcast listeners and watching on YouTube or listening on the go. And uh, they, it was great to hear from people that were calling, asking about scopes, but also were fans of the podcast and uh, fans of just hog hunting. And really, they just wanted to talk about all the hog hunting stories. Uh, and we talked for half an hour before we even got to, to talk about scopes. So it was fun. That, and that's the problem. I know. That's <laughs> it's a good thing when you're busy, yeah. though. I know I'm just like you. We all want to talk about hog hunting that's or right. coyote hunting or whatever. That's right. So. that's right. Well, Jason and I do like to talk, and it's probably a good thing that we have a podcast because we do we – do, uh, probably talk a little bit too much sometimes when we can probably a little bit, a little bit, but Hey, I wanted to say uh, a special thank you to a, a friend of the show. Uh, somebody that uh, a talented artist that actually, uh, and if you're watching on YouTube right now, I'm going to show it uh, made me, uh, this is a, basically it's a Skinner knife. It's a custom Skinner knife, handmade, custom made, put my logos on it, man. It's, I tell you, it's almost too nice to use. And, 
this gentleman's name, you can find him on Instagram. It's AJTX Knives. Uh, and for all y'all out there in East Texas, I'm going to spell that A-J-T-X-K-N-I-V-E-S. Uh, yes, I did have to look at it on the page because I am from East Texas. And so I had to check my own spelling, but go check him out on Instagram. Uh, talented artist, man, great, makes great knives. And it is amazing what he can do uh, with a, you know, just a, a piece of steel, uh, you know, does everything custom, friend of the show. Uh, and uh, go check him out, AJTX Knives on Instagram. Uh, I'm telling you, if you give him an idea of a knife that you'd like to make, uh, he can definitely turn it into a usable piece of art. And I'm I'm thrilled to death with this knife. My kids have already said that when I pass away, they want to be they want it left to them. <laughs> and Wait, you I'm, only got one knife and two kids. So one knife not, and two I kids. I already see a fight. I and see a fight coming. I said that I would come back to haunt them. Uh, out of the grave if they gave it to one of their boyfriends after I was dead and gone. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you something. I saw this knife uh, last week, and it is one of the coolest knives I've ever seen. That logo on there, uh, I'll just say this. I thought that it was laser engraved. It was a perfect match to Hans's logo. It was amazing and on said he does it all by hand it is it is awesome i'm going to be talking to him and uh, seeing about getting a knife made for yeah. myself because it was it's a really cool knife hey quick question uh -huh. did he make that sheath for it or was that something separate that you got yeah actually i got the sheath uh, uh on my belt right now so i can't take it off but yeah he he did the leather stitched the leather together um put my name on the on the sheath uh, he did everything. I mean, it was yeah, the sheath was nice too. Yeah, so go check him out on Instagram, AJTX Knives. That's K N I V E S, and uh, he's just man. He's starting to get a bunch of orders, starting to blow up. And uh, I'm I am a huge. I don't know if I've told everybody else this on the show, but I'm a huge nerd when it comes to knives. And I treat my knives. I, you, you can ask Jason. I'm with Jason. He'll ask me to borrow a knife. I'm like, no, I don't want no. you to use my knife because I want you to take the edge off of it. They're, <laughs> so, they're just for looks. He doesn't even use them. He just wears I, them around. And I love knives. I keep my knives in a safe. I've got some very nice, expensive custom knives that I've had uh, people that have made me in the past. Uh, this one from AJTX is my favorite now, uh, but I've got some nice knives and I keep them. my rifles. I throw them around. I don't, you know, I treat them rough. My knives are babied and I don't know. I've always had a thing for knives. And when I saw, uh, when I saw AJ and his work, I really, I wanted to get something custom done. So, uh, man, I was tickled to death, but speaking of you and I being together, uh, Jason and I, actually got a chance to hunt with each other again last week and we went there specifically to call up coyotes that was the main purpose we if we would have saw a hog yeah. we would have shot at it but we were there to shoot coyotes for a friend of his that's had a coyote problem on his property and uh man we had a good time we had a great time and i think we had a great time in, in spite of the conditions it was probably the worst kind of night that you can have for for thermal hunting it was drizzly yeah. uh intermittent sprinkling raining it was cool ish warmish it was kind of that <laughs> in was. between time like yeah. you 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 put a coat on and you know like a, a fleece or something pull over you get warm you take it off then you get cold i don't know it was just a kind of a nasty dreary night but we had a good time yeah a buddy of mine wes uh, took us out on uh, his family land, 1,300 acres here in uh, Nacogdoches County. And it was a, a mix of everything from pine plantation, hardwoods, mm -hmm. uh, to, you know, bottom land, cross some creeks. I thought we were going to die <laughs> yeah. in the side by side. <laughs> I did at one time. It was black, dark. We're going down this log road. He's like, I think I can cross this creek down here. And it's yeah. dark. And he pulls up to it and kind of pauses with the, with the, <laughs> we're in this, uh, gator, John Deere gator. Yeah. And all I can see is this steep drop off. And to me, it looks like it's like 10 foot deep. And I'm like, no, yeah. <laughs> but he, uh, he drove off. And I mean, I panicked for a second. I thought we were like <laughs> going to turn over and it was like two foot. But <laughs> you were definitely freaking about going through some of those creeks and those, that low area. There's there, no doubt, but we had a great time. It was fun. Yeah, we did. And you know, I, I have a little bone to pick with you because you posted uh -oh. something on Instagram about me and it's 100% <laughs> true. But so when I, Anybody that hunts with me uh, knows that my most important item in my gear bag 
uh, is a roll of toilet paper. And honestly, I got one sitting right here by my desk. <laughs> it, by your desk. Right I hope here. you do not have an emergency I, during one of these podcasts. <laughs> I take toilet paper with me everywhere. So I, I walk in Jason's house with a rifle and a roll of toilet paper under my arm. And boy, I caught heck for that the whole time. But I tell you what. I don't go anywhere without it because <laughs> this thing, this roll of toilet paper has saved my life more than my rifle has. And uh, <laughs> it is, uh, it, it is my MVP. It is my, you know, the, the most valuable thing in my gear bag. I don't leave home without it. I, you know, like I said, it has saved my life and I won't go anywhere with that roll of toilet, without that roll of toilet paper. And well, it's, you I know why it is these... though? Well, it, it's because when I go out and go hunt, I get excited. And I'm so excited. I get worked up, you know. And <laughs> Oh, my gosh. I'm not going to go this any further. This may fall under TMI. This is too well, much information. I just get excited. I, I get excited and nervous. And so that's, I, I, I get the toilet paper. I will say this. This is no joke. So, I mean, I've got all kinds of gear. And mm-hmm. Hans did, too. We've got rifles. We've got, you know, uh, you know uh, rifle cases. Uh, we're taking, you know, scopes for my buddy. We've got handhelds. We've got uh, trigger sticks, three sets of them. We've got ammo magazines, you name it. I and mean, we're carrying all this stuff out there. And I mean, tens of thousands of dollars of gear. And and we're out there loading this stuff in the back of this gator. And we're all getting ready. And everybody's pumped up. And, and Hans is literally, where's the toilet paper? Where's the, <laughs> oh, 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 get the toilet paper. And he's putting it over there. And, and like, it starts raining and is mist and drizzling. And I'm like, hey, man, we've got those rifle bags in the back. Where's my toilet paper? I'm like, golly, what what about this rifle and a $5,000 scope on it? Oh, no. No, it's waterproof. Toilet paper's not, though. So My toilet paper roll got a little bit wet, and nobody likes a soggy <laughs> roll of toilet paper. <laughs> man, I think we better talk about something else besides toilet paper. Hey, well, i tell you what I want to talk about. I want to yeah. talk about coyote hunting. Yeah. And I want to say that, you know, uh, our our, you know, our fans and our, our buddies that are up north. And I know there's guys in the south that coyote hunt too, but a lot of these guys that are, you know, really serious and a lot of them are, are doing it for the pelts and, and selling the fur up north. Every time I go coyote hunting, my hat is off and I have a newfound respect for these guys that do this seriously. Cause I'm like, this is so much more complicated than spotting a hog at 400 yards and walking up to him and shooting him. Oh, <laughs> it's just yeah, yeah. so much more skill going on in this coyote hunting. So, you know, just a little background on this place. Uh, Jason got invited out to his buddy's place who who knows that they're, they've seen evidence, coyotes, seen them, heard them, know they're around, and invited us to come out there and go, you know, shoot some of these coyotes. So when we went out there, you know, like Jason said, it was a pretty um, – pretty nasty night drizzling most of the night and uh it was it was it'd be it'd be kind of warm and then you'd go to another spot and it'd be kind of cool it was it was just kind of weird but so we really didn't know we thought we knew that they were in an area we weren't really hearing a, a, much activity really didn't see we drove around for a while didn't see we didn't see any anything. hogs on any, yeah. you know it, really anything at all maybe a, a couple of rabbits but that was about it yeah, but we we made three stands um Throughout the coyote collar, Jason was on one, one rifle and his buddy Wes. Um, and, and Wes had not, this was his first time using a thermal, right? If I That's were, right. Wes okay. is a, he's a big deer hunter and a quail hunter and he's, you know, hunted his whole life, but it was his first time thermal hunting. Right. I mean, he's done some night hunting and calling, but never with, uh, with thermal. So yeah, it was exciting for him. So we, I was running the collar and kind of spotting in the background and uh, we, we did get lucky. We made three stands and we did see coyotes. Uh, at all three stands, they, they were very, very far away. The wind was just swirling and we could never get it. We could never get in a right position because we get in a position. It would change. Uh, we, they would kind of come in a little bit, but nothing within a a good shooting distance, but they would just kind of, you know, they were trying to kept trying to get downwind of us and the wind would change. And then they'd go back to the other direction. But, uh, nonetheless, it was, it was a good experience. It is, you know, coyote hunting to me is, is I enjoy doing it. It's fun because it's a challenge. It's definitely a, a challenge, and especially you feel like you learn something new every time you go out. Uh, but man, it is a humbling experience. <laughs> it, it is that. And I'm going to tell you, you know, there was a lot of things that, that I was, you know, I think you and I were talking about some of this. Um, you, know, you, you and I hunt a lot at night and, you know, it was, it was Wes, uh, his first time with thermal out. 
and we all had a great time, but but you just start to realize, uh, especially when you you know you're there and you're kind of helping somebody, like hey, you know, turn the scope on here, and here's where you record, and uh, there's just a lot going on, especially with three people and a caller, and and we were you know out there in some huge pastures when we were calling at times, and we could see, oh, I don't know how far you think we could see some of those places. Uh, what do you think? Oh, uh, you know, in some in some spots and fields that we were in, I mean, gosh you know, seven, 800 yards. That's what I was, I was yeah. about to say, seven, 800 yards. Yeah. Which is a long ways for East Texas. I and mean, that's mm-hmm. a long ways to see. And so we were on some hills and stuff, but I, one of the things that strikes me is just, it's something that i talk talked to people about. Everybody wants to know, we've talked about it on this show before, but it's the idea of, you know, can I use my thermal as a handheld Mm -hmm. and you know for riding around we were on that that gator riding around the side by side uh for you know several hours and it would be fine for that and we were using handheld monoculars the whole time riding through the woods uh specifically helions pulsar helions they work great Uh, yes you could take your scope off and you could do that but when we were on those those sets there all set up on tripods and everything ready even then using that handheld was was difficult. There is no way, and I'm going to say this, there's going to be somebody that's going to email us or call us and say, yes, there is a way, but th- there's no way that you can reasonably use your scope as a handheld while you're calling codes. Right. Uh, I had, this is this the, an example of that. With my handheld, I've got the rifle leaned up on the trigger sticks in the cradle there, I've got the the butt stock against my shoulder, so I'm you know I'm kind of holding it. it it's, it's we're all good, ready to go. Scopes on, and I've got the handheld. And multiple times, somebody goes, "There's one over here," you know, uh-huh. four o'clock. And so, what do you do? I immediately, I'm trying to get the handheld into my my coat pocket. I just got to get rid of it. And it would be nice. What I should do, I was telling Hans, I need something to put around my neck to, to yeah. let go of it. But you're, you're trying to get rid of well, it. And there was one one set we were on. Yeah. Wes says, here they are, here they are, you know, they're coming. And I can't find them. Han sees them, Wes sees them, I don't. And I am got this handheld, and I'm trying to get it in my pocket. And I can't. And this is exactly what I tell people. It's not that you can't clip that scope onto your rifle in the daylight. It's not that you probably can't do it in the dark. Mm -hmm. But it's trying to do it with an adrenaline spike in a hurry. And everything, your hands become Play-Doh and just just like you can't get it. And I can't get that monocular in my pocket. And they're like, okay, okay. And they're getting ready to shoot. And I still hadn't got the hand held up. <laughs> and so eventually I just drop it. Yeah. I don't know what else to do. They're fixing to shoot. It's a disaster. And uh, when we get done with the, the set, you know, Wes goes, did you just drop that <laughs> monocular on the ground? Yeah. And I was like, I don't know what else to do. I'm fumbling. I can't get it in my pocket. And, you know, we're here to kill coyotes. And, yes, I don't don't normally treat my equipment that way. But uh, I didn't know what else to do. So I dropped a $3,000 thermal monocular in the grass. And it didn't hurt it. But it, it's just the point of there's no way you could have a scope in your hand and and get that thing back on there and and in the same Picatinny slot, Reezy right. Road, ready to go. So it's just a comment that, that I had an observation of actually – you know, refreshing my memory of, of being in those situations of where you're in a big hurry. Right. Because with hog hunting, that's, we're not normally in those. You know, we're spotting and then stalking up to them. Uh, and even then, I think you need your, your scope back on your, your mm-hmm. rifle. But anyway, I just was thinking about that. Yeah, I use a, a monocular too when I'm hog hunting. And, you know, I'm stalking up close, trying to get as close as I can and, and putting that uh, putting that rifle in the in the cradle and and sticking that monocular, I wear hooded sweatshirts with a pocket in the front where it's kind of easy to slip in there. But when you're coyote hunting, it's completely different because they come up on you so quick. You don't have a lot of time to 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 do anything to prepare. I mean, it's hard enough sometimes to remember to hit the record button because they oh, run yeah. in, they run in so quick. But yeah, I was up in the back of the the side by side up spot and and. Uh, after the cow runs off, we hear this thud <laughs> and, and it was Jason ditching his monocular <laughs> on the ground. You know, he's trying to get ready for a shot, but, uh, Hey, it wants you to also talk about, you know, some of the distance, uh, you know, with, with Wes, who's brand new with, uh, uh thermal hog yeah, or th- sure. you know, thermal coyote hunting. 
and some of the issues uh, with judging distance as well. Well, yeah, and I want to go one say one more thing real quick, go back to the thermal monocular deal. Uh, I know there's going to be guys that are listening to this and going, hey, that's all fine and dandy, but I don't have three grand for a thermal monocular. And I understand that. And we're not we're not saying everybody should own one. I am saying they're extremely valuable. Uh, I'm just making to the greater point, if you're riding around, you want to pop your scope off, I think it's fine. I don't think in a, a situation where you're going to need to be shooting within a you know, 60, 90 second period or less that it's necessarily uh, you know, a good thing to have your scope in your hand, you know, versus on your rifle. I right. just want to make that comment. So again, I'm not saying everybody, you know, has got to go out and buy a thermal monocular. I understand there is a, a limiting factor and it's, it's dollars and there are a lot of dollars, but yep. yeah. So I, I, my buddy Wes, um, I hope that he doesn't listen to this podcast because <laughs> I'm fixing to, we've, we've been very kind, but I think I'm fixing to drag him through the mud just a little bit. And, uh, so I may tell him just on purpose to go listen to it because, you know, I kind of get back at him a few things. So <laughs> no, you know, we were calling these coyotes in and one place we were on had woods on both sides and we were basically looking down a big, huge power line. And it went way down into a kind of a creek and came back up. And we were looking, I don't know, six, eight hundred yards there probably. And Hans put the collar down there and he turned that thing on and it wasn't any time. I mean, 20 seconds or less and two coyotes pop out on that, that power line way down there. And we see them and we're, you know, okay, everybody's kind of getting their scopes because they're, they're trotting on in from way off. And they were at a range that I would probably say, if I had to guess, were four or five hundred yards. And Wes, again, he, he I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm going to make fun of him, but I am going <laughs> to give him some credit here. He's not used to thermal. Never looked through a thermal scope before. I did give him an XP50, so he had a, you know, a 640, high resolution, super nice scope. But... Uh, you know, I want, so again, I just want to be clear here. It's not like I stuck him over there with, uh, you know, a $50 scope, but I gave him the, the, a super nice scope to use. And, uh, you know, so he can see him clear and they get to about four or 500 yards. And he's like, you know, are we ready to shoot? And I'm like, no, you, you know, you couldn't, or you're shooting a 300 blackout as I've got, you know, I've got yeah. one of my 300 blackouts with a 16 inch barrel. I'm like, you couldn't hit that thing. And uh, he's like, oh, yeah, they're close enough. They're close enough. And he's trying to look. And, and he even, I mean, had the uh, those big posts for these power line, big power line, transmission line. And he could see those posts. And he's trying to estimate how far those posts are apart. And he's like, oh, yeah, that, they're, they're close enough. They're a couple hundred yards. Like, no way. And so they finally, they get closer. And, and one of them kind of you know, goes off into the woods and this one coyote just keeps coming in closer, slowly. And he's getting wary, but he's getting closer and closer. And I know it's, he's getting close to that shooting range, but he's not there yet. And, and Wes is like, let's take him. Let's take him. He's 150 yards. And I'm like, he's 300 <laughs> yards or more. And we're having this mini argument over there. And, and it's, you know, uh, Hans is just laughing about it all. He's not interjecting. He's not helping me here. It's, it's my buddy. But I'm like, no way. They're way too far. So finally, this guy hangs up out there and it's obvious he's not going to come on in. He's gotten wary. And so he's kind of, kind of turning and, you know, throwing his nose up in the air, seeing if he can smell us. And I know we're probably going to have to shoot because it's just fixing to be over. And, and, you know, Wes was like, hey, we're not worried about educating them. Just shoot at them. You know, we're not out here every night. Shoot them. We have got to kill some of these coyotes. So I know we're getting close to that. But I put my crosshair on this coyote and he like halfway disappears. <laughs> I mean, he's that yeah, far. Yeah. And, and Wes is just like, take him. Let's take him. Let's take him. And I'm saying he's still 250 plus. You know, this is a long ways. And so anyway, we ended up, he did turn. I took a shot at him. For the record, this, the official story is that I hit him and that he, that he rolled up and then he got up and ran off. That's my story. Now, Hans seems to think that I just scared him and he probably needed some toilet paper down there. But I'm pretty sure that I lobbed one in there and hit him. But that, that's my story. Well, you, I, I will confirm that. I'm pretty sure it was a direct hit. 
Uh, now, in this lane they were shooting down was just about 10 yards wide. So I think he hit him and he kind of fell in the brush and maybe stumbled a number, you know, half a mile. And he was <laughs> snacking on something under a tree by the time we got <laughs> No, I'm joking. He, he was far. And I'm going to tell you, uh, he ran in a little bit. He, he caught wind of something. The wind starts swirling around and he ran out. I turned the collar off, started barking. He checked up. Uh, Jason lobbed a, it was a Hail Mary shot, basically. It was. It really was. And uh, that was that was about it. But, yeah, the, it's, you know, the being able to judge that distance is very difficult with, uh, with thermal, especially for somebody brand new, and especially even if you have used thermal quite often, but you're at a new, a new spot, you're hunting in a new mm-hmm. area. That also, mm-hmm. uh, you know, kind of makes it a little bit more difficult to do what you do. But if you're used to your scope, you're used to the, the, the magnification and the base magnification, especially you, you can get a pretty good idea of how far away your target is uh, just, just off of knowing it and using it so often. Uh, but it is for people out there that are brand new that uh, they, you know, we get calls all the time of people that want to shoot 200 and 300 yards away. Um, it's, it's different. It's a lot. I tell people that call, it's a lot different than shooting during the day. It definitely is shooting with a the thermal shooting at night. And I know we've talked about it before on the show, uh, as far as what, uh, realistic shooting ranges. Uh, but you know, that's, uh, it, it's something to keep well, and, in mind. And I, you know, yeah, I talked to a lot of guys that they do want to shoot long range. And I think the number one thing is if you want to do that, I think you need to be able to judge yardage. I mean, scary good yeah. to a T during oh, yeah. the day. Yeah, I think you need a. I think you need a laser range finder, and you need to be able to look down there at a random spot and say that's two hundred and seventy-five yards, and you better range it and be within fifteen yards of that. I mean, you need because if you can't do that during the day, then you're going to be off by a hundred yards at night, right. and maybe more than that. I mean, it's it is is very difficult and. You know, again, I know there's long range shooters. There's guys who can drive tax in the day and at night, and they're good at, at judging range. But a lot of times, I'll have guys. I mean, uh, that, that say, "Man, I, I want to shoot 400 yards," and uh, I'm like, "If you misjudge that, I mean, do, do you really? First of all, let's just get past Hans and I've talked about it before. You've got to be able to identify and know that target, and I'm just not comfortable with that. I'm just not comfortable with it. But if you are, uh, even if it's 350 yards, whatever, you've got to know how far it is and uh, you know know what your holdover is because I, the, I don't care what caliber you're shooting. Uh, if you've got a you know 100 yard zero or even a 200 yard zero, when you get out there at that three 400 yards. Uh, the difference in 50, 75 yards can be a lot because that bullet is is falling. Absolutely. And so uh, I, I always would say you need to be able to judge in the daylight and know you're right. And with a, back it up with a laser range finder. And then you got to have to know your holdovers too. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you can't rattle off the top of your head and say at 350 yards, I need to be here and at, you know, 400 need to be here, then, then it's going to take a lot of practice. But... Speaking of long range shooting and all that, uh, you know, that does segue into something we want to talk about, and that is the Pulsar Trail LRF laser range finder uh, models. Uh, that is a, it would have been a great time to have one out there, and it was was dumb because we actually had one. Uh, I've, got <laughs> one in my, at, I've got one in my yeah. hands right now. I'm showing. I know. <laughs> it, it was, it was, I had it. It was at the house, and we didn't bring it, which was just really dumb. But anyway, that's, that's Hans and I. We don't, didn't think that far ahead, but brought the toilet paper. <laughs> brought the toilet paper. The toilet paper's there. No laser range finder trail. We just, just had one for no good reason. Yeah. yeah. But so, you know, I would say that that I want to bring these things back up and talk about them because they are shipping now. We've you know, done a review. We've both done YouTube reviews uh, on our channels. We've you know talked about them on the, the Late Night Vision show. But I want to just kind of give an update. We have not talked about them since they've been released and they are actually on the, the shelves on the market. I don't know about on the shelves because they're they're very hard to get, and we can barely get them on the shelves when we do. They're sold, but, but they are out there, and they're slowly starting to dribble in as Pulsar gets more shipments every month. Um, the question that I keep getting, and this is from people that have watched um, our review videos and listened to us on the podcast, is they want to know, has anything been changed 
uh, you know, did they fix any of the problems or, or maybe not problems, but complaints that we had or suggestions? And my answer to that is maybe. <laughs> and the reason it's maybe is because the model that, that Hans and I had that we tested out was a prototype. And it's been several, several months ago. So I've forgotten exactly how some of the things worked. Even watching our videos, there's just certain small little nuances that I'm not sure if it's exactly the way it was or a little bit different. So I'm going to tell you how it works now. And some of these things I believe are changes. Um, the, the official word was there weren't any changes made, but I don't believe that. I think there were some minor improvements uh, unless I'm just crazy, which is always a possibility. Mm -hmm. But so let's talk about how it does work. And one of the, the, the main concerns that Hans and I both had was that when you turn on the laser rangefinder, the crosshairs disappear. Mm -hmm. And that was something that we both didn't like. And then it was like hard to get them back. I say hard. It was one of those deals. Adrenaline, you're trying to get them back in a hurry and you could wait so long and the rangefinder would time out and your crosshairs would come back. We even got a video out there of me screwing up and, and taking a shot under pressure without the, the crosshairs up. And I, why are I you laughing? I can't believe you admitted that on the podcast. I, I but hey, and hey I showed it, it to the world, my yeah, stupidity. True. But true. I've gotten some sympathy. I've talked to some customers who watch it like, I can see what you it's did. It's a demo. There. I, can I see mean, what it was brand new. It wasn't even introduced in the market. So you were one of the first ones right. to get to test it. So but, and it came with no manual. We had yeah, no exactly. idea. Didn't know what the buttons did. Nobody knew. We were we were pirate pioneering this thing. So, what, what the way it works now is when you press, it's the front button. So if you're familiar with the trail, it's the very front button. And when you press that button, the laser rangefinder box pops up. And when it pops up, you can put it on the animal, press it again, and it will give you a, a distance. If you if there's no input, meaning if you press it and you don't press the button again, nothing happens. It's about two to two and a half seconds before that box disappears and your crosshair comes back. That's very short. So it, it's it, it can be almost annoyingly short. It is it, it is super short, and that would have solved the problem that I had on that video where I couldn't get my crosshairs back. Mm -hmm. Is is it's just you know, press it, pops up, one, right. two, boom, the crosshair's back. That's that's not long. Right. And so, number one, I think that's been shortened up. That's a good thing. Number two is the question of, do you range with the crosshairs, or is it a separate box in a different location? And it is a separate box in a different location. And I, I want to speak to this because uh, something was explained to me uh, by Pulsar, and it made more sense. This was uh, after uh, you know my rep had visited the, the factory overseas and talked to them about this. After you know we had done these uh, you know demos of the scope, and the point they made, and this is logical once you you hear it, that laser rangefinder is attached to the side of the scope, and it has to be zeroed to that box. Mm -hmm. Meaning you can't just slap that rangefinder on the side of there and it magically be exactly where that little box is aiming. So those things are zeroed together. And I don't know whether the adjustment is made in, I'm assuming the adjustment is made in the, uh, in the software side. Not They're not actually moving the laser rangefinder module on the side. I, I, don't, I don't know. Just make the assumption they're, they're moving the box around. But it is zeroed so that when you put that box on something, that's exactly where the laser is pointing. Otherwise, it would do you no good. So that's a fixed uh, zeroed position. Well, your crosshairs are going to be somewhere different because mm -hmm. you shoot your rifle, and who knows, it may be shooting a foot left. And so you're zeroing that. So you've got two different things, basically crosshairs, for you know, lack of a better term, two different points zeroed on that rifle, one for the LRF, one for the bullet impact. And that's why they aren't together. So it is just still slightly above the crosshairs where they're at. And uh, anyway, it seems to be be fine to me. I don't, now that I kind of understand what's going on there, I'm not saying it can't be fixed with software. It's not something they won't ever do. 
that's the way it is. And to me now, uh, especially that that timeout is really quick, right. it doesn't bother me. Yeah, it, um, it, it didn't seem, uh, you know, we've both had this this unit now we're testing, and these are the ones that are basically hitting the streets now that the people are getting in their hands. And that, that issue seems, uh, which was a small issue, seems a lot better than it was uh, in the demo models. Yeah, I agree. You know, the, the third question that everybody wanted to know was, you know, do the crosshairs completely disappear? And the answer to that is yes, but there's a workaround. Mm -hmm. It might have been this way in the prototype. I'm Again, it's just been too many months, and I'm not sure. Uh, if it is, I overlooked it. Either way, it doesn't really matter. I can tell you how it is today. It doesn't really matter what it was like six months ago. But today, on the production units, if you press and hold that same button, so press it once, you're in you're in just a, a quick, uh, you know, not scan, just a, a quick range mode. It pops up, no input from you, it just goes away. If you press and hold it, then it pops up and you're in scan mode. So now that box stays there permanently until you press the button again and everything you pointed at uh, and stop on, it will attempt to give you a yardage on. All right, so that's that's super. But now your crosshairs are gone. You've got to press the button to get them back. But what you can do is you can turn on picture and picture. And when you turn on picture and picture, you have that small little postage stamp size uh, you know, picture up at the top of your screen and your crosshairs are there. So that is a, to me, a super alternative and workaround. So if that coyote out there is at 300 yards and you don't want to shoot him till he's at 175 or closer, you put it in scan mode, you take the picture in picture and now you've got the best of both worlds. Oh, you yeah. keeping it on him. You're watching him trotting in. Here he comes. Here he comes. He's getting closer. You know, 215, 210, 205. He's at 175. You just lower down. You've got right there with your your picture in picture with a crosshair. Boom. Put the hammer on him. Yeah, that was one of the big concerns, you know, with the final production market, I think, was uh, when testing the demo. Was it going to completely take away your ability to take a shoot while, take a shot while you're in scan mode? And man, I'm going to tell you, that is, a, that is huge that you can still shoot in the picture in picture mode while you're scanning, scanning ranges. Cause as we all know, especially coyote hunting, when you're using the laser range finder, those coyotes are running in hard. They're moving all over the place. You're sitting there trying to range it and then having to fumble back and forth to get your reticles back. But what Jason just said again is you can scan your laser range finder, have that mode up and also have your picture in picture up with the reticle in it. So you can essentially take a shot uh, with the picture in picture with your reticle and still be in scan mode where you're ranging. And that is, right. that to me, that is huge. That is, that to, you know, that is what exactly everybody wants, what everybody needs. And it, uh, that is a great, like you said, if it is a fix, uh, it, that's a great fix because when we were out demoing it, I, I remember the reticles going away completely and not being able to mm -hmm. get it back until you get it out of scan mode. It might be mm -hmm. different than the way I remember it, but when the, this model came out, the one that's actually going to be in the consumer's hands, that was a huge deal, a huge thumbs up to Pulsar for making that and making that happen because, uh, you know, with, like we said, with coyotes running in and out, Animals a lot of times don't sit still and wait for you to shoot them. <laughs> you know, they're, they're all right. over the place. So being able to range and take a shot at the same time, perfect, uh, hands down. Well, I, I absolutely agree. You know, and there's one more thing I want to touch on here briefly is that we mentioned this when we talked about there was some news we kind of broke uh, about the LRFs, and that was that uh, they were actually going to be coming out with more than just the XP50 model. That's right. where everybody originally, that's what Pulsar said, this is what's coming. Maybe some other models later. But when they started shipping, uh, they're shipping XP50s, XP38s, XQ50s, and XQ38s. And, and we've had you know all of them coming in. Uh, so currently, right now, uh, first week of December, the XP50 LRF backorder list uh, with Pulsar is extremely long. They're only getting a few of these units in. Uh, the ones that I've gotten in have been pre-sold. Uh, we're expecting some more units, but we just have no good timeline. Those things are dribbling in mm -hmm. and, you know, a handful at a time. 
the XP38. Uh, I'm just going to tell you, I don't, well, that is something Hans and I need to talk about here. <laughs> Let's talk about these models and what's logical. Um, I don't personally, to each of their own, but I don't personally see the need for the laser rangefinder on the XP38. For those that don't know, the XP38 is the 640 by 480 high resolution uh, Pulsar Trail, but it's a, it is a, a 1.2 optical magnification. That's essentially almost no magnification. Mm -hmm. And I just don't see why, because any shots you're going to be taking with that are going to be close range. Right. It's a, it is a close quarters rifle, and unless maybe you're shooting subsonics, and you know you really have a, a short range, and you're concerned about that. It just doesn't seem like a, a I don't know, I don't want to say logical, but maybe just like a logical purchase to have it on an XP a 38, even the XP 50, and that's what everybody seems to be calling about, and they're really interested in the XP 50 with the laser rangefinder. Even that model is still, it's a 1.6 optical magnification. That's still a closer range mm -hmm. scope. Yep. It's normally not something you're going to be taking those long range shots with. So I can see the, the desire to have it on that scope, but to me, the logical two scopes to have it on are the XQ50 and the XQ38, and that's where they're at. I mean, we, we've been getting some yeah. of those. We've sold almost all of them. I think I got one left, uh, sold one today. That, to me, just makes more sense because the XQ50 is a 2.8 optical magnification. The XQ38 is a 2.2. Mm -hmm. So my line of thinking is that's the scope that I can take 200-yard shots with. That's yeah. the scope that if you really have to reach out there on a coyote at 250 or, or further, that's where you need to know the range and you've got the magnification to do it. Yeah, you know, I think a lot of people, because of the, the stigma uh, and all the hype about the XP50 trails, the 640 resolution, you know, they, that's, they want the, the best that's out there. Uh, but I think once they call and we get a chance to speak with them and we find out what their average shot's going to be, there's a lot of people that have, uh, you know, really talked themselves out of the XP50 uh, and and moved into the XQ50 Trail LRF because it, it is suited more to their shooting style and, and what they're going to be hunting and the ranges that they're going to be hunting at. And, uh, I, you know, those XQ50 Trail LRFs have been flying uh, off the shelves and they've been doing well because it is, it's the, a lot of people that are calling about the LRFs are coyote hunters that are shooting, uh, you know, 200, 250 yards away. And, uh, you know, that's something right. with a higher base magnification is more geared to what they're wanting, to, uh, you know, what they're needing. But I think it, again, mm -hmm. it is, it's people here, you know, 640, it's the best resolution. Well, yeah, but it's 640 at 1.6. That's the, right. The first time that you bump that up, and magnified it cuts it in half and i think once you explain that to people and people understand how the base magnification and resolution works and how it how it affects it when you mag, you know when you do any type of magnification i think they start to understand and they realize hey i need something with a higher base magnification as opposed to something with a higher resolution at the base uh and and it really um you know that xq50 uh, and also the xq38 is definitely a good choice for a lot of people a lot of coyote hunters a lot of a lot of pig hunters that are shooting long shots. It's not Jason and I. We're not. We're not out there doing it. But there's a lot of people that are shooting long ranges like that. Yeah, and there's a lot of people. I mean, just like our, my, my buddy Wes. When you're new to it, especially uh, that, I think it's a worthy upgrade for the dollars. You know, I've got to make a confession. So, I've told several people. I've told a buddy of mine who's big into thermal. Uh, you know, he said before the LRF had actually hit the shelves, he, he you know, knew we tested it. And he goes, what do you really think? Is it worth it? Mm -hmm. And I was like, mm, maybe oh. coyote hunters, maybe long range. But if you're going to shoot, you know, 200 yards or less, I don't really think so, whatever. Well, <sighs> getting out and using them more and more, and especially when, you know, and you know, Hans and I have talked about this, we hunt a lot on our own property so we know those yardages and it takes getting out there and getting on somebody else's place that you're not familiar with 
to, to open your eyes and go, oh yeah, not everybody is always hunting exactly. on a place where they know every single yardage of where everything's at. It just, you know, being out there the nine lot, 1300 acres and going, you know, I don't know if he's 300 or if he's 250. Right. And that's a, there's a big difference, Absolutely. you know? Yeah. I might know when he gets under 200, but so I don't know. I, I really do think that there, there is a place for these LRFs. Um, I'm, I'm thinking that this is just, you know, crystal ball in it. I think this is something we're going to see more of, and I won't be surprised that if in the future, this doesn't become sort of like a, a video recording deal where yeah. just a lot of the, the you know, nicer scopes are, are putting it on there. And again, speculation, this may be a fad that goes away, but I don't think so because you're never going to get away from the, you know, just the, the common problem of judging distance at yep. night. Yep. And so I, I think it's, I really do think it's worth, uh, you know, a worthy upgrade especially in that xq38 xq50 i think it's affordable worthy upgrade so anyway that's my two cents on it <laughs> really happy with them we can't hardly keep them and i know pulsar can't make them fast enough so uh it's been a been a great thing to, well, to see them actually finally come out and, and be good well kudos to pulsar for listening to the consumers because there's been a lot of demand for somebody to come out with a scope of the laser range finder they were the first ones to do it and uh, they've done a good job with it. And I know, like you said, Jason, this may be the standard moving forward with some of the, uh, you know, some of the different scopes. So, and that's, that's definitely, uh, it's a, it's all about value and putting as much stuff on it there is. as you can. And, and this is definitely the, the, the pulsars that have the LRF on it. It's definitely a lot of value within those scopes. Like Jason said, they're flying off the shelves. So if you're interested in, in uh, learning more about this scope, if you're interested in purchasing any of the LRF models, uh, like Jason said, give them a call. Uh, you can call Jason at 877-350-1818. You can find all these products online at OutdoorLegacyGear.com. Uh, and, you know, please, uh, like Jason said in the beginning, please go subscribe to the Late Night Vision Show. The show's growing uh, like crazy. We've got some exciting things moving forward in the future that Jason and I are excited about. Uh, and we've got people coming on that's going to be uh, very uh, knowledgeable and going to shed a lot of light on a lot of different things in the industry. We've got stuff like that coming up. We've got some changes with the show that we can't announce right now. But hopefully here in the soon, uh, we'll be able to, to announce some new things that we're going to be doing. Uh, but for Jason and I, I'm going to say thank you. Thank you for joining us. Go, you know, go check us out on all the socials. Uh, we appreciate you joining us this week, and we look forward to getting back with you next week. Y'all have, have, <laughs> have a good week and take care. I can't say I, I'm stumbling. Y'all take care. <laughs> <laughs>